Adam, Adam, if industrial design were lawn ornaments, you'd be a plastic flamingo. You'd be a headless Santa. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer the Podcast. For product designers, engineers, makers, geeks, freaks, and people who like wallpapering their bedrooms in caution tape. Oh, yeah. My name is Adam, industrial designer of CadJunkie.com. And my name is Josh, mechanical engineer of SolidSmack.com. Each week's show is broken into three brain throbbing halves. Mm-hmm. First, we're going to serve up the top product design stories from this week's news courtesy of SolidSmack.com. Followed by techie tips, tricks, and Q&A compliments of CadJunkie.com. And finally, we're going to talk with special guest Joe Moak, senior product design engineer and founder of FormLovesFunction.com. Joe Moak, it's an honor to have you with us today. If you could sculpt the moon into the bust of any celebrity, who would it be? Charlie Sheen, of course. Okay, Joe, stay put. We're going to be hearing more from you as the show goes on. Uh-huh. Josh Mings of SolidSmack.com. The time has come for you to siege the gates of ignorance with oh, your yeah. massive mental battering ram. What have you got for us this week? Well, this week's Solid Smack update is brought to you by SolidWorks 2012. 3D for professionals. Juicy new features like real-time costing and large design review are already helping designers make better, more informed design decisions. Get the full scoop at SolidWorks.com forward slash launch. Look out render free. Week's Bunk Speed has released Bunk Speed Pro 2012. This combines Bunk Speed shot rendering and Bunk Speed move animation into one GPU loving interface. This integrates NVIDIA's IRA technology into both tools and allows advanced features like displacement mapping, photometric lights, and more keyframe animation options. Ooh. It comes in pretty steep, though, with a $34.95 price tag. ShapeSpace is creeping their way deeper into 3D search. The company creating the software that allows you to visually search your solids and surfaces continues to work data delivering deals, the latest of which will find their technology serving up geometry in the Actify portfolio of product collaboration tools later in 2011. 3D search, baby. Look, Ma, we are in the future. Whew. Carol Bartz, former CEO of Autodesk, is now the former CEO of Yahoo. A controversial 19-month reign of Bartz was ended with a phone call from the board chairman letting her in on the news. They passed on a sweet offer from Microsoft back in 2008, and they've all but put up the for sale sign after this shakeup. But really, who would want to buy a company that puts the ya in who? We've all seen yuppie designer boys obsessing over every possible use of a shipping container, from disaster shelters to full-fledged prefab office buildings. Well, Skypack is now repurposing airplane trolley carts for use as ultra space efficient furniture in tiny urban dwellings. Nice. Google Core 77 Skypack to check it out. And BIS Publishers released Open Design Now, a book that hopes to do for industrial design what the open source movement did for software engineering. We've seen enough of these movements come and go to maintain a healthy skepticism, but we'd love to be wrong. And it's a great gesture nonetheless. So if um, I'm really interested with the Skypack thing, uh, you know, repurposing these airplane trolley carts as hipster furniture, I, I just think, um, you know, we hear about this kind of stuff all the time. It's kind of kitschy, kind of fun. Um, but there's this big movement lately of people talking about um, reusing old stuff as if it were recycling, as if that's the responsible green thing to do. Um, and I don't know if I agree with that philosophy, but I would love to talk to you guys about that a little bit. I think it's great. I mean, there are very few materials that are actually recyclable. Most of them are actually downcycled. So sure. if there's an opportunity to take, you know, something that someone has already paid a bunch of money to tool up and build and Mm -hmm. distribute and you can take it that thing as it is and you know do something else with it immediately without having to run it through additional processes Mm. that seems like a a pretty good uh you know use of material and kind of a i don't know a a global uh responsibility sense and uh man if you get some hipster cred out of the whole process (laughs) i mean seems like maybe a bonus or maybe a minus, depending on who you are. Yeah, I I actually love this idea. I come from the aviation background, so I I had to deal with these these carts all the time. The thing is, though, they get, these things get the hell beat out of them. So so trying to repurpose them in in themselves is just a, a task. So credit, Credit for that, for getting them working again, because 
uh, really just be easier to get new ones and slap some uh, you know slap some skins on them and yeah, stick yeah. and stick them in your apartment but i mean they they look nice they're small they're they're easy to move around so i've also i've also heard a lot of people in the past talk about why is the software movement so open um, and why is the design movement so closed and I just wonder what the mentality difference is that uh, that leads to that. Yeah, I, I would say that it's just uh, their own personal interest. They want to get recognition or, or paid for what they want to do. They're already, especially if they're independent designers, they tend to, you know, you're 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 making quotes on stuff, and you're already stretched thin by the demands of the client. Well, I think programmers would argue would argue that they're busy too. They would, but I think there are. It, it's it's a stereotype for sure. There are people out there who will design icons, and actually, I think some of the open source software has some pretty pretty nice UI elements to it. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, there are people that are doing it. So would you guys, as engineers, would you would you work on an open source engineering project where you're giving away your invention ideas? Yeah, I mean, depending on, you know, the scope of the project and, like, the the final goal. Like, if it was something that was, you know, worthwhile for, you know, humanity or whatever, yeah, I, could, yeah. I could see throwing in some time. But um, I'm not down with helping somebody design a widget that they think is going to make them gazillions of dollars yeah. for free. It's becoming easier to think about uh, to, to be part of, like, a, a group a collaboration effort in engineering that... Uh, that you know you don't have to worry about someone stealing your design because you're all working together on on a design and people are interested in what you're doing and you and you're being part of something so it's i mean that that's attractive that's starting to become more attractive to more people i think hey wait josh is uh is that your kid in the back <laughs> yeah oh my hey, hey uh, what get that out of your system what are you Get it out of here. Get it out of here. Okay. Okay. We're gonna be right back. Oh goodness. It's all over the place. Adam O'Hearn of CatJunkie.com. I hear the phones of Cat Junkie HQ have been ringing off the hook this week. What have you got for Well, us? this week's Cat Junkie Q&A is brought to you by SolidWorks 2012. More than a cat package with ripping fast performance enhancements and an all-new equation editor. He loves that new equation editor. It's kind of sad how much I love it. Check it out at SolidWorks.com slash launch. So... We have another question this week, but first I want to test those brain muscles a little bit. I've got three questions for you. The first person to answer correctly gets a point. The first two out of three will be our winner. You ready to play? Yes. All right. We all know that early computers were programmed using punch cards with patterns of holes in physical cards used to communicate with the computer, but punch cards uh, had been used for human-machine interaction before number-crunching computers were even invented. Where did the idea of using punch cards to communicate with machines come from? Punching people in the face. No know. idea. Uh, music boxes? <laughs> Actually, that's a, great, that's a great idea. I don't know if, if a music box came first. Uh, the, the answer that I was going for was, um, was looms for weaving. Oh, oh it's so obvious. Interesting. You yep. used, I know, you used loom, you used a punch card to allow the needle to go through in some areas, but then block it in other areas. And that would, uh, that would create your pattern. How clever. I like it. Very clever. All right, zero points for both of you, so better, <laughs> one of you better get these, uh, <laughs> these next couple. All right, uh, multiple choice on this one, though. So one of the earliest programming languages was IBM's Fortran, which was actually a contraction of formula translation because it was one of the first languages to fully abstract the machine code instructions into human readable text. Fortran was developed in what year? Was it 1954, 1960, or 1966? Riveting question. Let's say 1960. 50, I'm going 54. You got it, man. Ugh. Joe, Joe is up one. Question number three. In 1953, Grace Hopper at Remington Rand suggested that perhaps computer languages should be written in English rather than random numerical computer codes, and they said she was crazy. Crazy. By 1958, <laughs> she and her team had released the first ever version of their business-oriented computer language called what? Was it A, Flowmaster, B, Flowmatic, or C, Flowmotion? I was going to go with COBOL. Uh, oh, that's actually a good, <laughs> very good guess because it was the lead-in to COBOL. <laughs> Cobol was designed oh, wow. after this one. I'm going to go Matic. It seems like a Matic, uh, a Matic decade that it was designed in. All right. I'm, I'm thinking master, the master language for the 
Man, you nice. would think that, and you would be wrong. <laughs> Joe Moak, you are this week's champion. Oh, come on. Uh, that computer language was called Flowmatic. Um, hi, <laughs> this is Cindy again, <laughs> like from last week. So anyway, the um the jewelry thing didn't totally work out, but I think it's okay because now I'm gonna like um start doing hair. I think. <laughs> so I was wondering if maybe you knew like something that could make. Um, it's easier for me to, you know, not mess up people's hair. Um, cause I, I cut my dad's hair the other day and I mean, it looks really good. <laughs> but I mean, it, it would have looked good if like he was nine and he cut it himself. So I was like, oops. <laughs> so, um, thanks again. I got, okay, bye. <laughs> okay. We've been talking to Cindy the last couple of weeks. Cindy is, um, well, you know, she's Cindy, and uh, she has uh, failed with her jewelry business from last week, and this week she's decided to get in to doing hair. She's gone to cosmetology school and did a disastrous haircut this last week and wants to make sure that doesn't happen again. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways she might possibly avoid making mistakes, um, you know, in the future with her haircutting. We're going to bring haircutting into the industrial 21st century for a little bit here. <laughs> What does um, this have to do with anything? <laughs> first of all, Joe Moak, you are really into CNC machining. Is CNC haircutting in her future? <laughs> uh, could be. You know, the, I, 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 can, I, I just designed it in my head. <laughs> CNC haircut. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Are you going to yeah. make it open source? Because Absolutely. I'm just seeing one of those mounted on a six-axis robot arm. Oh, yeah. Just, just lay down underneath this uh, milling machine here and get your scalp drilled. Would you like a paraffin dip with that? Okay, so there are so many options for Cindy. First of all, she could do mock-ups where she just puts wigs on people and cuts the wigs first, right? Which is a little bit limiting, but, you know, you could do some stuff with that. It'd be kind of crazy. But then, you know, if you're doing that, why not just do a, you know, use PhotoFly or Scanner Killer, take a 3D scan of the head, and, uh, you know, build a, build a crazy beehive haircut in 3D. Why not? I think they're already doing that, actually. I mean, you can't go to some salons and actually get a mock-up of what your hair is going to look like. Yeah, they use Photoshop stuff, really simple yeah. Photoshop stuff for that. I think. Yeah, actual programs. Yeah. Well, so I was thinking also, you know, why, don't, why doesn't she put, you could actually take that to the next level where you, you have the salon and you have a, uh, a 3D motion tracker on the forehead. And let like RTT Delta Gen like put a real time 3D hair live video feed on the head. <laughs> How much is this haircut gonna cost? <laughs> <laughs> well, Seriously. you know, Delta Gen's gonna have to go down in price a little bit. Sorry, sorry, RTT. Little hint there. Fine. Uh, yes, we get it. But now we have to get on to more pressing matters. Like the fact that I've been pressing your face against the desk for the entire conversation. Look, my neck hurts. Would you? As you know, today we sat down with Joe Moak, senior product designer and creator of formlovesfunction.com. We brought him on because, well, because he is Joe Moak. So, Joe, we have a few questions for you, buddy. And the IV connected to your neck is feeding a powerful truth serum directly into your middle cerebral artery. All right, uh, Joe, so first, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got where you are today. Yeah, I uh, went to school at Cal Poly, studied mechanical engineering. I did an internship at Arterial Vascular Engineering, wow. uh, nice. later bought out by Medtronic, uh -huh. which got uh, a little medical device experience on my resume. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. uh, when I was graduating, um, I got a lot of interest from medical device companies. And uh, so, yeah, medical device experience uh, started at a... Uh, at a school at a defibrillator company called St. Jude. Then I went over to a, uh, uh, a company that was making a neural implant and I worked there for five and a half years and uh, learned to be like super anal and particular about all my details. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've been doing consumer products for the last, oh, five and a half years or so. Uh -huh. Fantastic. So we've talked a lot on EVD about designers and engineers uh, who kind of live in that space between design and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, but you take that to a whole new level uh, with your, you know, form loves function blog um, and your work. So for you, the engineering and design uh, parts of the process are inextricably linked. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, when I think about the products 
that I really love and like the products that, uh, you know, in my mind have kind of got it right. I would love to know what those are. Well, I have an Aprilia SXV 550 Ooh. Uh, that, uh, that I love to ride around. And that just seems like a beautiful piece of engineering, hmm. you know? I mean, it looks, it looks mean. The motor is mean. Um, it rides mean. Like, it just, you know, is kind of a, a unified uh, symbol, of, symbol of power that delivers on uh, the message that it sends mm. when you look at it. <laughs> and, nice. Uh, nice. and uh, you know, I, I consider that, like, a well-delivered uh, well product, you know, mm. engineering-wise and design-wise. And, uh, you know, in my experience, um, those, those kinds of products come about through this uh, sort of, uh, you know, hard work between the, from both the engineer and the designer and kind of a mutual respect. I know that yeah. uh, it's fun to, it's fun to pit designers against engineers because the two come from two completely different Wait, about, are you about mindsets. to, are you about to tear down the premise of our show because I'm going to have to stop you right there? <laughs> uh, no, so designers and engineers must fight. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's where my head, that's where my head is at. And then with Form Loves Function, I'm just, uh, I'm attempting to appeal to both mindsets. Mm. Well, I think you definitely do that. I, I, I'm the designer on the show, and uh, I friggin' love your, your site, so. Uh, oh, awesome. Uh, that's inspiration for me to post a little more often. Okay, so, I mean, uh, this is a totally different question. Uh, it, but it's kind of related. You know, it seems increasingly that the realm of invention is thought of uh, as more about soft UI experiences on digital screens than about hard physical interactions with objects. And I'm just wondering, is it really ideal for hardware to get out of the way and purely be a vehicle for pixel-based interaction, or is there still a place for physical user experience design in products? Wow. wow. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, just take one aspect, um, haptic feedback. Sure. Right, like how the, how the product feels in your hand or, um, you know, when you're sitting on a chair, for example, or hell, even on a motorcycle, right? Yeah. Um, these are all really important aspects of the user experience. And yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of innovation around, like you say, the software and like the on-screen UI. Um, but I, you know, I totally believe that's only, uh, you know, half the picture at, at best. So uh, Form Loves Function has, does have a, a lot of videos lately about old school machines, like the 100-year-old one IBM clocks, the cam-based machining, and... Uh, a really fun piece explaining how iron is refined from 1938 and and yet your work is designing high-tech gadgets using high-tech manufacturing techniques could you talk a little bit uh, about that dichotomy yeah you know um in my head there's there's not a lot of there's not a ton of difference between the two and that's kind of like i looked at that um the steel the, the iron refining mm. video and i thought man you know what like some of the machinery is a little different, but this process is pretty much dialed in and was dialed in, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. And the steel that we're getting today is kind of going through the same process. The equipment has changed a little bit, but for the most part, you know, the fundamentals are all the same. And then I realized, I mean, we talked a little bit about open source design and that the book, uh, you know, being mostly about design process. And, you know, the process has changed so little. And, yeah. um, I just love this uh, this notion that there's like these you know underlying fundamentals somewhere. Like if you ask enough questions and dig deep enough, um, you can find like these simple rules of like physics, hmm. you know, rules of nature that uh, that are really stable over time and pr pretty relevant. Fantastic. Joe Moak, having you on the show has been better than that time I swept Mustache Toberfest with the creepiest mustache award. Thanks so much for being with us. That is fantastic. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been fun. Hopefully we can uh, chat more in the future. Oh, man, I really, I really do hope so. Okay, if you would like to send a horsehead kebab to EVD HQ, please address it to Adam. And if you want to send us cow tongues, uh, please send those to Josh. Engineer vs. Designer is a lot like a cow, except we need comments instead of cud. 
please give us some feedback on engineerversusdesigner.com. Insults welcome. If you desperately wish you could drop kick us in the grapes, be sure to like us, plus one us, follow us, or whatever else, as social media has also been correlated with negative reproductive side effects. Special thanks to Ross at rotspartan.com for the blues licking going on in the background. Go Ross. We'll see you next week, and remember without engineers, designers would have mirrors instead of computer monitors and stare at themselves all day. And without designers, engineers would punch themselves repeatedly all day long. Uh, Snuffleupagus. Baby bop.